the service unto this point, Lord, you've already uh, done and, and touched and spoken and strengthened. That, Lord, I pray that through your word, Lord, that you would affirm that what they uh, already in the sense of worship, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. In Titus chapter 2, verse 11, it says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. When he says to all men, in other words, it's for everybody. Amen. And as soon as you receive this uh, grace, this salvation that's been given us, given it through us through grace, he says, this is what it's going to do. This is the power of it. Verse 12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust or lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So here in this form, Titus is speaking and he's saying, when you receive this salvation, when you receive this grace that's been given to you, it's going to teach you how to deny ungodliness. It's going to teach you how uh, not to allow yourself to go and get tied into worldly lusts. The word worldly lust there is the, the cares of this world or the attractions of this world. It's talking about a also a sense of a financial or a sense of a relationship that you have towards what you live for. It's giving us a sense of understanding that when God is speaking and he's declaring to people, he's saying, listen, if you receive this, what I'm giving to you, you're going to be able to deal with the things that you're going to deal with in this world. How many know that's awesome? that we get the opportunity to be able to live righteously. Oh, come on. Can you give me an amen? That righteousness doesn't come from a human in the form of what we do, but that righteousness comes from Jesus Christ. He died on the cross to give you something that you did not deserve. Righteousness doesn't come from the work of what I do, but actually from the one that I have accepted. And when I accept Jesus Christ, that the grace of God or the sense of what he has done for me starts teaching me how to live a good life. Come on, look at somebody and say, are we living a good life? Am I living a good life? And the sense and the form of the life that he's actually to live, he's not saying to let out the desires of your lust of what you want to do and call that a good life. But he's saying, live out a good life with not allowing yourself to be enticed by what happening, what's happening in the world. And when I started looking up the word worldly lust, I started seeing a sense of, it took me to a story in the book of Luke chapter 16. In verse 1, here in this manner of, 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 of story, he's uh, coming and he's talking to his disciples, and he said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward. And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. Now again, the word wasting his goods was the sense that he was wasting it in worldly lust. He was uh, mismanaging the salvation and the grace that was given to him and he was, uh, the fruit that was through him was giving it to the freedom of lust. And here he's speaking to this steward. And he starts to give a parable about this steward. How many know that we are stewards of the salvation, the grace that God has given us? If you don't say amen, you might need to get saved today. Because everybody here should say amen if you're saved. If you don't believe that, then you need to read your Bible. You are a steward of the goodness of God inside of you. You're a steward. So that word steward there is, means us. And he's speaking and he says, verse 2, he says, So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? He comes and speaks to the steward. Have you ever been spoken to by the Holy Spirit? And he says, why are you 
compromising the way you never compromised that before. You've never been corrected that way? How many know that the word of God, the gospel corrects us? And he says, here he says, he comes and he says, for you can no longer be a steward. Thank God that Jesus doesn't fire us. Now, how many know that this is before the cross? And he's speaking actually to the Jews that don't have salvation. And he says, then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? What shall I do? What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. Now, in this verse here, verse 3, again, he sees the owner of his Life as a master. See, many here today see their salvation or their God as a master. How many know that he's a father to you? But the steward's seen him as a master. And because he sees him as a master, he's getting the response as a master. And the truth is, is that when Jesus comes to you, he comes to empower you to start living out what you cannot live for yourself. See, it allows us to empower us to deny, to deny the things that are trying to entice us to bring a bondage to our children. Not to invite the things into a house and say, go ahead. So that way our children could become worse than when we were. So look at somebody and tell them you're a steward. You're a steward to what your father has given to you. You're a steward. And you might be thinking right now, what in my life, if this is what's going through your mind, is good. It means that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. What in my life have I allowed to come into my life that now I am straying away from the goodness of God? I ask yourself that question. Where in our life or family have I strayed away from the goodness of God. Maybe I've left certain values that I don't honor no more. That the enemy has came to take that away from me. So the steward asks as right away when he's going to come to ask for an accountability of his life. Of his finances. He says, what have you done with what I've given you? I heard that you're misspending what I gave you. The first thing you must recognize that when you receive the goodness of God, when you receive the salvation, when you receive the grace of God, it was given to you freely. But yet, even though it was given to us freely, we must understand that we are accountable to that free gift. To release that gift to those that God has put around our life. He says, how can they know that you serve me? He says, by loving your brother. In other words, the accountability of servanthood, of releasing what he has done. And so he says, man, my shame. How many know that condemnation comes to you when you know that you should be at a certain place, but you're not there? All of a sudden, the enemy comes and condemns you. That's what happened to him. He was ashamed. He said, man, I can't do this. I can't even, you know, I don't want to go. I might go and shake the pastor's hand, and I don't want to do that. You know, I'm not ready for that level to go help or whatever, right? He comes, and, and, and he's ashamed of it. And so he says, I can't beg. So right away, when condemnation, shame comes to you, you start lying and cheating. First thing that happens when you feel condemnation, how could I get out of it? And then verse 4 says this. Is that okay we teach today? Are we good? I have resolved what to do. He says, in other words, after thinking so much and stressing so much, he sits there and he says, I know what to do. Humans know how to cheat and not trust God. Instead of trusting and standing still and waiting for God to move, this man comes up with an idea. He says, Man, I gotta, I gotta find a way 
to pay these pg e So I got to tell them, you know, I got seven kids in the house. You got to let it go. You know, please forgive me on my pg e bill. I, I want to, uh, come on. Right, right? And all those are lies. Nothing but lies. But yet, the following month, again, the pg e is going to be there and the bill is going to go right back up because you're not a good steward. He says, I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of stewardship, they may receive me into their house. And then he goes on and he starts to tell, he goes to the, uh, all the ones that owe the boss. And he says, you know, uh, my boss owed you $500, but you know, um, right now I'm in a position to go ahead and forgive you of some of that money. Now the boss didn't tell him to go and that's his, that's the boss's money. That's not his money. That's the boss's money. But he's giving free money to the ones that owe the boss because he's afraid. He has fear that he might not have a job no more. When you start leading in a manner of fear, it's very easy to lie because you're afraid. No amens, amen. I like that one, Pastor. That's a good one. Very easy to lie because you're afraid. Very easy to lie about your income, about everything you do because you're afraid. I didn't tell you, honey, because I know you were going to get mad, but the, but, the, but the tool is really good, honey. We need it. I, I, I know what I'm talking about, right? And those that are single, you lie to yourself. Like, I'll see by faith. I'm going to just see how God sees it through. But you didn't really need the shoes. Come on. Come on. And then you're trying to get stuff. But by faith, you're going to see that by that month, you're going to replace the rent. And look at your neighbor and tell him that's so foolish. So foolish. And people live this, this constantly calling it faith. Calling it faith. And that is not faith. The psalm says that is stupidity. It's a bad steward that continues to fall into a hole and says to himself, again, I'm here. Again, I'm here. You've been living like that for the, all your life and you're always saying again. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and tell him he's speaking to somebody here and I don't know if it's me, but we'll find out. In verse 5, again, he tells a story and he's talking to the servant and he speaks to the servant and then now he starts giving away money. He says, how much you owe my boss? You owe him 400 bucks. Okay, listen, I'll, I'll forgive you 200 or 100 bucks and go ahead and just pay 300 and right now it's a special offer because I'm afraid. And the, and the guy says, cool, how much? 200 right now, let it go. Here, it's 200. I don't know him no more? No, you don't know him. And here it comes and so, but just for... But just remember this, that when um, I get fired, right, just remember me that I might come and knocking on your company and try to get a job with you. Is there anybody in the house of God? Don't ever build something out of lies and manipulation because it's going to fall. And so I don't want to stay too much on the story. The story just goes and, and some of you could receive it as like, um, you know, uh, am I a bad steward? Well, let's find out if you are. Amen. And then in verse, I want to go to verse 10. He goes back as verse 10 and he says, he tells the story right about the steward. And then in verse 10, he comes out and he speaks this. These three next verses are very vital and very important. He says, he who is faithful, what is least is faithful also. With what is and also in much. Now, now he's talking about money, and he says the least of life is money. But humans think that that's the greatest thing in life. And I mean, if we talk to you, eighty percent of your problems is about. As a matter of fact, right now that we're talking about this, some of you can go to the restroom and say, "I didn't come for this eat. That's why I don't go to church." Right away, you start dealing with these. He says, faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He says, the least of these things, the least of was that. The fact is, I got greater things than that. The greater thing is that if this man would have trust me, I would have probably not, 
I would have forgave him and he would have kept his job, but because he was dishonest with me and now he went around the whole desert, now I got to make him understand that he is, that the least thing in this life made him quit the greatest thing. What are the greatest things? The love of God, faithfulness, forgiveness, can you give me an amen? The greatest thing is having joy in the midst of your family and having peace. How many know peace is one of the greatest things you could ever have in life? I don't know if you understand me, but if you are, if you're, if you're over, let me see, let me see, 25 years old, you understand what I'm talking about. I just want a little bit of peace in my life instead of thinking about all this stuff that I need to do. And he says, the least of it is the money. Stay faithful. And he starts to speak to him about the fact and then he says, and he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. This word unjust or unrighteous. And we're going to see here in verse 11. Again, and in verse 11, he says, therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon. Now here the story changes after he speaks to them. He's actually talking to Israel. And he says, Israel, listen to me. Listen to me. Your father, in other words, Jesus, has shown up. And you've been managing in life the blessings of Abraham. And you have given in to the Roman Empire and compromised trusting me. And now you trust the government to feed you. And so what you did is go along, start forgiving people like if you have the power to forgive somebody. And he says, you don't have the power to forgive somebody. For the Son of Man, the Son, the son of God came to forgive men. Can you give me an amen? You don't have the power to forgive somebody. Jesus inside of you gives you the power to say, sooner or later, I understand that I forgive you. Is there anybody in the house of God? And that's the theology of the chapter because we must stay within the context. Can you give me an amen? Without conning nobody. That's right. And he says we must understand that in the midst of this, we must know that because of the least of it, he started to talk about trust. He says unrighteous mammon. How many know that the word of God says? That we are the righteousness of Christ. So he says, I gave you righteousness. I gave you empowerment. But yet you now are living under an unrighteous spirit. Because the word mammon didn't translate. It didn't change. It's an Aramic word. It's a Hebraic word that came to say, I'm not talking about money no more. I'm talking about that what's dominating your life. He changes it. He says, I'm not talking about what you did. Israel, I'm not talking about what you did. I, I'm not talking about no longer. This is the problem that you have. You've been dominated by a spirit of mammon. That's heavy, huh? The spirit of mammon is a sense of living out unrighteousness. He comes to them and says, who will commit to you and trust the true riches. And the true riches is the fact if the, it is the goodness of God that it was given to you. He's giving them as a parable and he's telling them, listen to me, you've been dominated by the spirit that's controlled your mindset of the way you are. The reason why you're constantly begging and you're constantly poor and constantly submitting to that voice in your mind is because the spirit haunts you day and night. How does it haunt you? By the bills knocking on your door. Amen. And so when that starts to happen, it starts to bring a stress. Everybody say stress. A stress that gets you so stressed that you start being unfaithful. Has anybody ever been stressed? Oh, come on. Only three people. Has anybody ever been stressed? Be on. I mean, I think it's the whole house here. We're humans. 
Can you give me an amen? I can lift. Those are online watching me. Amen. I know some of you sitting at home right now because you're stressed. I don't want to go to church. I'm just going to watch it online. You're stressed. You're upset. You're going through it because you feel like God is not coming through for you. Look at somebody say, he's a faithful God. He's a faithful God. And in verse 12, he comes out, he says, and if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? In other words, he's telling if you haven't been faithful with what God gave you, then how are you going to be able to get people to be faithful when you start becoming a boss? And then I come to verse 13. And in verse 13, he draws the line. And in verse 13, he says, no servant can serve two masters. Oh, hello, somebody. He gets the spirit. This spirit has tried to level himself to me. Why are you trusting mammon instead of trusting me? There's people that get married just because of mammon. The spirit of mammon has controlled their thoughts, their lifestyle. They get a raise and they think they have it all. Hello, come on. The spirit of mammon makes you feel because you got your taxes, you have it all. Walmart, here I come. And you're like a baller at Walmart. Bam, bam. And it feels good to be a baller because you've been poor for 11 months and you've been waiting for this check to come. So now let's go. Let's go have a stay. And then once it's gone, there you go right back into that lifestyle. Everybody say, that lifestyle is breaking today. Come on, say it with me in the name of Jesus. That lifestyle is broken in the name of Jesus. I'm not a poor man. I am a rich man in Christ. I'm not talking about just physical things, my friend. The greatest things is the spiritual empowerment that the heart beats forgiveness. The heart beats the peace of God. The heart beats the trust of God. I am trusting God. I don't want to preach, man, but I'm going to preach anyways. Is there anybody in the house of God? Is there anybody in the house of God? There's many women today that look at their husbands and say, what are you going to do? You're the provider. My brothers and sisters, I got bad news for you. You're, if you belong to the body of Christ first, Amen. Your husband is not your provider. The provider is Jesus. Your husband might get fired tomorrow, but Jesus Christ will see another door and that door will open and you walk in it and we're back to business, baby. Yes, yeah, some of you look towards humans. Forgot where I'm at in my notes. The spirit of mammon was the name. The reason why they called it mammon was because it was a god to the Syrians. It was a god that brought a sense of greediness. They were lavish to themselves. They were good to themselves. But when it came down to giving something out of themselves to somebody else, they were greedy. They always found an excuse why not to do it. That's the spirit of mammon. The spirit of mammon is always speaking to you. That's why you go from one job to the next because you have no purpose. Purpose defeats and submits the spirit of mammon. You have no purpose. Where are you headed? Because money comes in and out. Hello. But when you have no purpose, you have no stability. And because you have no stability, you're always in need. The attitude of the spirit of mammon wants to make your decisions. It speaks to you. It talks to you very clear. It takes and it gives you an attitude where you start submitting to an attitude. I paid for this. I got the job. My hands labored for what I did. Not understanding, my friend, that you and I are 
on earth on borrowed time. I don't care if you live a hundred years, you're going to die. I don't care if you live 105 years, you're going to die. We're not here to be eternal. This is not our eternal place. Sooner or later, we're going to leave this earth. You are a manager. Can you give me an amen? Of what the boss has allowed you to continue. Some of you, man, you should have been dead. You had cancer and yet the enemy came and tried to take you out. But somehow, whether it was the hand, it was always the hand of God. It wasn't that medicine. It was the hand of God that moved through that medicine. And you're still here today. Some of you should have been dead. Some of you should have been caught. But God set you free. But yet the spirit of mammon will come to you, make you feel like you have the power. You feel powerful when you get that check. The spirit of mammon says constantly we don't need God. Now, you don't say it out of your mouth, but your attitude tells it. You trust on what the breakthrough that you got instead of trusting in the God that gave you the breakthrough. Is there anybody in the house of God? The spirit of mammon is to take opposite direction of God. God says, son, I need you to learn how to start being hold the value of being generous. The spirit of man will tell you, you don't have enough money to be generous. It's always in contradiction, constantly speaking. Some of you that have been Christians for many years, you know what I'm talking about. That's probably why you left the last church. The attitude that it takes is to be able to understand mammon is always saying, continue to buy and sell and keep it. But God says, sow and then you will reap. Mammon says, cheat and steal. But God says, give and receive. Mammon is always looking for servants in the church, for servants in life. Who will serve them to speak to somebody else and knock their faith down on trusting God? They're servants that mammon builds. They try to manipulate the word of God and say, see, this is not here. This is not here. This is not what he's saying. When it's just very simple. God gave his son. It was very simple. We received this, son. So right away, the first thing we receive is a spirit of generosity because he gave his son and his son is in us. And that spirit is generous. Is there anybody in the house of God? Is there anybody in the house of God? Praise the Lord. See, understand that when the enemy comes to speak to you, he tries to rule your life. The whole point of this chapter was the fact is, or not the, the whole chapter, but to verse 13, he's talking about, he's saying, he's actually saying, who will commit to your trust? This whole thing is about trusting. In other words, if I got this bill here, money is not good or evil. That bill right there is not good or evil. He's not talking about money. That bill there is no, neither good or evil. That $20 is not speaking right now and saying, I'm going to be evil. Let me see. It becomes good or evil as soon as whoever picks it up. Now it became good or evil. Because of the spirit of mammon, he is allowed and made many people divorce. Many people have lost their marriages and their families because of the stress and the constant nagging and constant frustration of not having enough. The Lord doesn't want you to live in the land of just enough. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you what he has did on the cross of Calvary, what he was raised on the third day to give you a spirit that will allow you to be healed in your body, to give you peace, to allow you to understand 
Trust me in the midst of your struggle. I will take you out of it. See, to trust, you must understand, you must have faith. Without faith, you can't trust. It takes faith to trust. Faith is in relation to grace. But the grace of God came to all men. Teaching. It relates. Grace does not forgive you of your sins. The Bible says that the love of God covers the multitude of sins. Grace came to open the door for you and I to receive his love. To activate his love. And how do we do that? It's through faith. We walk in the door. By faith, I'm walking in to receive what he's already given me. Is there anybody here today? Some people say, I don't come, but when I came, I come here, I come to hear this message. Maybe the Lord's telling you something. Can you give me an amen? So he's saying trust or faith. That's what he's talking about. He comes that the spirit of man was unrighteous money, but yet he's not just talking about the money, but he's talking about the control of how you manipulate or how you live your relationships in life. Understand that many of us struggle because our relationships have not allowed us to prosper in life. Tell me who you hang around with and I'll tell you who you start becoming. The word of God says that. Paul told them that. He says, don't, don't come to somebody that's unequally yoked that doesn't believe like you because sooner or later it's not going to work and you're going to break off. And some of you talk to old Christians or people that have old manners of ways of thinking and you ask them a question and of course they're going to talk like that. You know why? Because that doesn't never benefit them to trust God. They trust God for their salvation, praise the Lord, but to trust God in your life is something different. To trust God that I'm going to manage my family right and to live good in my family with my children. That's a whole different story. To trust God to get up that morning. Can you give me, have you ever been sick thinking you're going to die? Somehow you start trusting. Can you give me an amen? But why do we have to wait when we die? The Bible's not saying for you to die. The Bible's saying live out who died in you. Live it out. Walk to work trusting God. Saying, when you receive that check, I trust you, Lord. I'm going to be faithful because of the fact that I have a faithful God in me. <laughs> if you're in your 20s and 30s, you might not understand me. You're in the hype of money. And when you hit your 40s, some of you don't understand what I'm talking about. All of a sudden, things change. Like, whoa, true. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. But what's going on here? <laughs> You know, I'm too old to go and work for a company. They'll fire me, but I'm too young. I mean, when I was young, it was everybody wanted me. But when you get to a certain age, not everybody wants you. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Hello, can you give me an amen? Home Depot say, can you still walk? Yeah, okay, we'll hire you. Can you give me an amen? <laughs> yeah. But yet the truth is, my friend, is not everything's going to come out of those easy little places. God's going to say, listen to me, it's not your age. Even though you're 90 years old, Abraham, I will supply a child for you. Even though you hit 95, I am the God that moves. I am the God that starts working through you. Can you give me an amen? Look at somebody tell them, it's not my age, it's my trust. I trust God. And when God moves, my friend, he opens doors. Is there anybody in the house of God? Come on, say it with me, trust. Come on, say it again, trust. Let me behave a little bit and calm down. I get excited. And this is why he comes out and speaks. The spirit of mammon was a spirit of greediness. It was a spirit that makes you pursue gain. Constantly gaining, never having time for church, never having time for your family. You're constantly gaining. Some people even... Don't care to leave us, uh, leave here the word just to go work and make another dollar on Sunday. I'm going to pay you double. I'm going to pay you the per diem. Come on now. Shoo, how much? 
Forget that. Let's go. And you leave everything just to follow. Oh, my God. Some of you already went through that. You know what I'm talking about. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you already went through that. Hello, can you give me an amen? You go and follow mammon because the spirit of mammon says it's going to take you out of your troubles. You're going to be able to buy that boat that you always wanted. You're going to be able to have those new boots and you're not going to have to struggle. You could just slide the car and it's really nice. But at the end of it all, that spirit of mammon, when you're gone, is messing up your children, messing up your life, messing yourself up. And by the time he's done with you, he'll spit you out and you'll say, hey, I'm not responsible. You trusted me. I didn't trust you. Is there anybody in the house of God? Can you give me an amen? The gospel's for free. That's why he said grace is for free. It's not, it don't cost money to be healed. Is there, because there's somebody that already paid the price. He already paid the cost. He said, I already paid it. Receive it. Come on, say it. Receive it. <laughs> Mammon will always give you a dream, but you'll never be able to fulfill that dream. Gives you a vision, but he always puts a price on that vision. People die just to have it. One of the most wisest, richest men in the Bible said in Proverbs 3, 9 in the Message Bible, he said something here that we could learn here this morning and maybe take an effect. He said, no, uh, Proverbs 3, 9 in the Message Bible. He said something. And he said, it's kind of small. Is it small? Yeah, I couldn't read it earlier, but trust God from the bottom of your heart. The richest man here is saying, this is how I prosper. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try, let me put those glasses on because I already, I already. Don't try to figure it out. Everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do. Everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't, 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 don't. Come on, somebody online. Mm. Don't assume that you know it all. Some of you are so wise that you think you're set where you're at. Your boss comes and hypes you up a little bit. And as soon as that thing goes down, boom, you're first. And he says, don't assume that you know it all. Run Run. Everybody say it again. Run. Online, say it. Come on, type it. Run. Say it louder. Run. Say it all. One, two, three. He's not saying go pray, go do. No, no, just run to God. Father, right there in your truck, pull over. Can you give me an amen? That's why he closed the freeway on five for two days just to get you to run to God. He says, stop looking everywhere else. Just stand still and know that I am God. And run from evil. There it is right there. Run from evil and run to God. That's, 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 that's money right there. He says, it's not evil. He goes, either how you're going to grab it, what are you going to do? And your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with, with. Verse nine, verse nine. Is that nine? Is that 10? Honor God with everything you, come on, read it with me. Ready? One, two, three. Child, he loves that God corrects. And Father's delight is behind it all of this. The wisest man said, always take care of God. Because God will always take care of you. And some people say, I don't need a gift for God to take care of me. My friend, listen to me. You have mercy and then you have the operation of grace. 
Mercy is on human kindness. Every human has the mercy of God, but not everybody has grace. That's why it says it appeared to all, but not everybody wants to take it. I call this message end time supply. Can you give me an amen? End time supply. End time supply. I'm going to finish with this really fast, but I'm going to give you a picture of what the enemy does when he comes to try to take you down. In John 10, 10, the Bible says like this, and then he says, no one takes, uh, John 10, 10, he says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they might have, and that they may have it. Come on, say it with me. More what? More what? That means that whatever the thief has came to try to take from you, he says, I'll replace everything that the enemy has taken from you. When you trust me, I'm able to allow you to know that I will take care of you. And some of you, you feel like orphans. You feel like your father has not taken care of you because you're struggling at home. You're struggling with your marriage. You're struggling and you feel like an orphan. This orphan spirit called the spirit of mammon, he makes you feel like an orphan. He feels like you got to make it happen. You got to go get up and do it. Come on, without you, without you, you can't do it. And there you are struggling, begging for jobs, doing this application and that application. Come on, I'm a good worker. You prostitute yourself in front of the person and say, I'll do this and I'll do that. And I could do this. And when you get the job, you don't do nothing that you said on the job. You know why? Because you made it look good in the beginning. But your heart was just after the money. It was not after to serve. It's just to fulfill my need. But I really don't care to work. Stay quiet in here. This is how it works. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lanta. Are you ready? Tell your neighbor, this is not time for you to go to anywhere. Don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. Tell your neighbor. Tell your neighbor that. Tell him this is not the time. We're not done. We're not done. Can you move this pulpit for me? Move this for me? Just to the side real quick. You, you, you're going to be my, you're going to be my guy today. You could leave it. Leave it. We don't need that. Okay. Stand right here in the middle, right there where everybody sees you. Hold on. Before you stand there, bam. And this is what he does. This is what he does. This is what the enemy does. You don't have to move it way out there because and then, you know, all right. <laughs> he makes a trap. And this is all in the mind. All in your mind. Okay, I'm going to display it physically. But this is all happening in your mind. Where the enemy takes you out is in your mind. You don't want nothing on the outside. He wants you to be miserable in your soul. Understand that. So if everybody said, the devil took my car. No, no, no. That was your bad stewardship. Okay. That's because he got your mind and now he's getting everything on the outside. You ready? So he says, he waits for you to walk around and live your life. The devil is so patient. Until you land where he wants you. And as soon as you land, just one, just one, just one. Help me out there. Come on, little, little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there you go. Can you, yeah, yeah, there we go. And guess what happens? Right there at that moment, you got away with it. You got away from it. But, it, but he says, I will come back on an opportune time. I'm going to wait again. I'm going to get you. But I'm going to be patient. And he's patient. Very patient. And he opens, especially if you're a big fish. In other words, you, 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 you really had your whole kids. Come on, we're going to go to Bible study. We're going to go to, you, you know, big fish. He wants big fish. And he sits there. And bam. And he waits. And he comes here. Yeah, got you. Got you. And then the enemy, you're walking around. He lets you walk. He lets you feel free. 
He'll let you feel free. And you're walking, but something's wrong. But yet you come to church, you're mad at somebody, you feel like, oh, you're, you're walking around, but you're limping. It's not, come on, brother, walk around the desert. Amen. You're walking around the desert and you're limping. You're good until he comes to a place and you get tired. And then when you get tired, what he does, he does this one time. He says, just one time you thought it. One time you allowed it. One time. One time. And then when he gets you like this, you're trying to walk. Stop walking. Yeah, there you go. You're not going to do. You're not going to forgive. You're not going to give. You're not going to do that. I'm going to control you because you came under my authority. You're under my spirit it now even though you're a man of God but now here comes the killing the first one he says he says the thief comes now all come only to steal the first thing he steals is your joy to even come to church to even give to do anything spirit of mammon right here and then he starts talking to you all day she don't love you no more he don't love you all day, he'll speak to you. And then when you start thinking, you start confessing. When you start confessing. When you start confessing. <laughs> you're not good enough, okay. You start confessing. I'm, uh, okay, and then you go back and he's, when you start speaking. When you start speaking what is godly. He stops. Every, nobody moves. He don't move, neither you don't move. Because you confess something that he has no more authority to go to the next round, he has to stop. Because Colossians chapter 2 verse 15 says that he was disarmed. The reason why, hold on, hold on. This is to somebody. The reason why he feels armed is because you continue to believe what he has spoken to you. And then you start again in your mind going through it. And all day, has some of you ever gone through it like this? Ain't no one going to hire you. You, she's going to leave you. You have no more money. Spirit of mammon always looking for somebody that could afford them. But yet when they don't have no more money, boom, they're gone. That wasn't true love. Is there anybody in the house of God? As soon as I can't give to you, boom, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. You're going to pay child support now. Come on now. That's why they made it legal. Come on now. Because I can't trust God. So I'm going to trust you because that's your responsibility. And we allow people to go ahead and let them feel they have power over us because we don't trust God. And he walks around still. And then he don't kill you yet. That word kill it doesn't mean kill like a kill a person. That word kill there, you know what it means? It means possum. It means plain dead. He's not out yet to kill you. He stills, he makes you feel like, what do I do? And you're trying to find an idea of how to get out of that what you're going through. He does it in marriage. He makes you feel this way and you're constantly going through it. And for the sake of time, I'll, these are all thoughts. These are all thoughts. These are all thoughts. These are all thoughts. He goes and 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 pulls until he puts and you can't breathe no more as a Christian, as a Christian. Your wife started compromising with you when she used to stand up to you and tell you, no, that's not of God. And now she just flows with you. Your husband used to say, honey, let's not go that route. Oh, the enemy pulls and he's pulling to kill your family. He's pulling. So he's wanting. And as soon as he has you, as soon as, don't let me trip you. Don't let me trip you. Come, come down. Come, yeah, don't let me. You can't? Why? You're stuck. And some of you have been feeling like this for years. You're stuck. You don't want to serve. You don't want to help. You don't want to trust God. You don't want to trust God for your marriage. You, you, and you're stuck, man. You've been stuck. And you've been safe for 15 years. 
10 years, five years, but you feel stuck. You don't have that passion no more. You don't have that desire to do what God's called. You don't have it in you no more. You know why? Because he's choking the air out of you. <gasps> I can't breathe. I can't breathe. You're breathing fine on the outside, but your spirit inside is saying, you need to trust me. I know what I'm doing with you. Trust me. L give your time. Be generous. Learn how to give out. Trust me. And then he says, he comes to destroy you. Come straight back. Straight. No, no, lean back. Come on, trust me. Trust me. And some of you having... 1 Peter 5.8. Just real quick, I'm almost done. 1 Peter 5.8. Come on, you're going to take me a little fast so I can finish. He says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Some of you, you're, you're at the end of your marriage. You're at the end of everything. You, you, you don't even have the desire to do nothing. You're always complaining. You know how the spirit of mammon comes to you? Always complaining. You're complaining about something. You serve in the children, you're complaining. You serve over there, you're complaining. You're always complaining. You're complaining about something here. You complain about your marriage. You complain about the kitchen. You complain about the restroom. Complain, complain, complain. Always negative. And the spirit of mammon is choking your family with that complaint. It's better to be on the roof with that one. A nagging wife. Complain. And the spirit of complaining ties your family up. Because they'd rather not come home to hear that and stay out. But I like 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. This is the, char the character of the enemies to steal, kill, and destroy. And 4.4 4 says this. For I know of nothing against... First Corinthians, for, for I know nothing against myself. Yeah, I, Second Corinthians 4, 4, was it? Or, help me out. Second Corinthians 4, 4, okay. Second Corinthians 4, 4. He says, come on, says, help me out. He says, whose minds, uh, uh, give me uh, NLT, NLT. He says, whose minds the God of this age? Listen to me. He says, has blinded. He says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the mind of those who don't believe. He's saying, you stop believing because you're tied up. You don't believe in your marriage. You don't believe in giving. You don't believe in nothing because he's tied up. But don't say to go buy a new tool because oh, I, I, we have enough money. We'll figure it out. Look at this. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message. There's many that are not understanding about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. The message is the exact likeness of God. The message that is preached is the exact likeness of God. And he has you tied up. But as soon as, give me a microphone and get the worship up here. As soon, give me a microphone real quick. Give me a microphone, something that works. As soon as, as soon as, as soon as, listen to me. The enemy has you tied. But as soon as you start, who are you? I'm a son. Son to who? Jesus Christ. Son of God. Can you help me somebody to hold this mic for him? Because he's, he's paralyzed and we always have to help people because they're paralyzed. You have 15 counseling sessions, but you're still paralyzed. You leave like this. Can you help me again? Why? 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 Because you don't want to, you, you don't, you don't, you don't want to be released. But as soon as you start, I need a preacher inside of you, brother. As soon as you start speaking, as soon as, yeah, come on, speak it. Come on, speak it. As soon as you... The enemy he, has no power uh, over me. Uh, it, the enemy don't have no power over me. And as soon as you start declaring, 
as soon as having disarmed the principalities and powers, he made a spectacle of them, triumphing over them. And as soon as you start speaking, this robe, this robe, as soon as you start speaking, you're not speaking. Preach it, brother. That's how God raises up preachers. You got to preach your way out of it. You got to speak your way out of it. And as soon as you start speaking, honey, right now we're going through some stuff, but I love you. We're not going nowhere. Son, I'm tired of you doing dope. But son, you got a home. Come home, I'll preach to you. Can you give me an amen? And as soon as you start speaking, 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 can you give me an amen? As soon as you start speaking, something in the spiritual realm starts coming off of you and say, I'm not in that condition no more.